Welcome back to episode 26, part two. In this part of the episode, we will go deeper into AI and machine learning with John and Amy. Happy listening. Most of our leaders are probably savvy enough to understand um, you know, some of the, the background information on uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, and maybe some of the limitations we have with weather and climate prediction. That just means that there's more research to be done, right? And so the partnership between academia and industry and, and the government, for that matter, is, is really important. It, and it sounds like AEI2ES is able to really harness the goodness of all those worlds to, to propel this forward, right? Um, I'm curious for the hyperbolic media articles that say AI is coming for our jobs. I say our like humanities jobs. Um, and one of those articles is even like, Hey, A AI is going to be the new weatherman. Let's dispel some of this. Is AI really coming for our jobs? There's this concept of human machine teaming that, you know, maybe the, the machine, the artificial intelligence of the machine learning can cue us on some things um, and, but, and allow humans to think in other and different ways. A couple threads there for, for both of you to pull. John, let's start with you and then uh, Amy, give you a chance to, to, to pile on. Yeah, so I think the human machine teaming is absolutely key in, in the way that the weather company approaches this. Um, we have a system called Hotel, H-O-T-L, human over the loop. And what that means is there's a human who's observing our automated forecast process. You know, again, AI driven, data flowing all the time, relearning all the time, automatically generating our forecasts. But the human can sit and watch that system and see where there's, there are forecasts that maybe aren't, aren't uh, hitting the mark. Maybe they know something about the, the microclimate or they know something about how different models have been performing recently and they want to add a, a filter or uh, a nudge to the forecast and the humans can do that. They can interact with the automated system and they can make that change. And you know, particularly if you get extreme events, we, we had, we've had, for instance, um, wildfires that um, the smoke impact is not maybe caught well by the models that we, the American weather prediction models that we use as inputs. And so um, there is much more blockage of the sun than, um, than the models are anticipating and the temperature is much lower um, than the models are anticipating. So a human can come in and say, I can see what's going on here physically and I can lower the temperatures. Um, and that, if we have an extreme event, um, you know, uh, a, a heat wave or a cold spell, I mean, there, there are various places where sometimes numerical weather prediction models are a little bit slower than the, the human to catch on to what's going on. And that's, that's where the, come, the human can come in and, and add to that. We also, I'll just give you another example. We have automated we, we um, serve a number of airlines with what are called TAFs or terminal aerodrome forecasts. And for a long time, those are written by human beings looking at the forecast, different models and, and writing out a forecast. Uh, it's a, a specific text format. But, but recently in the last couple of years, we've, we've automated that. We said, well, we're, we're generating this, this AI driven forecast updated all the time. Let's use that and translate that into TAFs but not leave it at that. We still want the human to have a, an oversight role. So what the humans can do is if they don't like the TAF that's being created, they can go in and edit the forecast in the airport location. And so that benefits not only then the automated TAF is, is rewritten, uh, it's, it's better, it's aligned with the, the human intuition there. And everyone else who uses our forecast on their, on their phone or on their computer gets the benefit of that uh, human added value as well. And, and then I'll just add humans are, are key, still key for communicating what the forecast I, means um, to, to our customers, to airlines, we have embedded meteorologists, that, that I, kind of thing. I can positively say that you have aided the human um, condition by automating TAF writing. <laughs> that is the least fun activity on this planet. I have spent one twentieth of my life doing that. So about two years of my life, I think Ryan, you probably did too when you were at a hub. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, yeah. Back in our air force days, that was, we were called, um, TAF. Well, 
Anyway, we supervised a lot of people writing taps, but tap burgers, flip flip a tap burger. Flip, is that flip what the we tap call burger. <laughs> well, and I think this is the story of automation and that what, one of the promises of AI is that it can come in and, and do those things which are you know routine and boring to free the human up to do the more interesting things. Like our embedded meteorologists and the airlines are working with dispatchers to translate what the, the forecast is to what it means for them or the air traffic uh, coordinators. And, and that's much more interesting work. I think you'd agree, Jeff, than, than you know, slaving over the task. Well, we talked a lot about in, in past episodes about the importance of, you know, risk communication and uh, weather and climate communication and conveying, you know, that there's just so much work to be done from a social perspective, let alone a science perspective. And, Mm. AI isn't quite, you know, AI is great when you got a lot of data, right? And so the social aspects, we don't have a whole lot of data with uh, with with social metrics and that sort of thing. Um, Amy, did did you want to take a second to kind of pile on to to John's uh, comments there on the the human machine teaming aspects and, and what you're doing in the AI two ES realm? I just want to emphasize that we're not trying to develop anything that's replacing humans because that's not our goal. And you also talked earlier about government collaborations and we're working closely with NOAA and everything we're doing with them is to develop something that will help make their jobs easier and help them focus on the decision support. So more of the interesting stuff, less of the boring stuff, right? So the, the example I'll give is actually the product that the, in, the student is working with John for the summer, right? We've had for two years, a student who's been working on a project to automate the detection of fronts, the cold fronts, warm fronts, uh, occluded fronts and stationary fronts. This is something that the forecasters spend a lot of time doing. They have to produce a product over the United States every three hours. At, uh, John can tell you what the weather company's rules are. These are the NOAA ones that I know about. Over the United States, they're doing one every three hours over the whole domain, which is basically Hawaii all the way to, over to Europe. They're doing it every six hours. And, you know, it's a tedious process and they want to make sure they get it right. And so we're producing a product that's AI based that can give them a first guess, right? We're not trying to replace all of those forecasters. What we want to do is give them the ability to then use their human th decision making to focus on the more important tasks, the places where the AI has gotten it wrong, the places where it's really critical because there might be something mission critical happening there, et cetera. So I just, I want to emphasize that, that, the, that, you know, you talked about the hyperbole. AI is not coming for our jobs there. AI is coming to help us. It's not coming to take over, at least in what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. And, and I want to add, um, just, just ahead, very briefly, that one of the really exciting things about the A2ES, the NSF AI Institute, is that we have a very strong risk communications component of that. Yes. We are looking at the social science of what do users want? What One of our, uh, Julie DeMuth, who's one of the leaders of that, talks about user to research topics. We talk about R2O, research to operations. Let's start with the users. The users inform the research, which um, hopefully transitions into operations. Thank you. I wanted to get to the social science too, and I hadn't gotten there. So thank you. That is really, really <laughs> important. It's part of it's a key part of what we're doing, right? Because we're studying the users. We're studying why they might use the AI, why they might not use the AI. And we, that involves studying their needs. You don't want to develop they something trust just it. because it's pretty. What, what, will, what will it take for them to trust it and use right. it? Yeah. So, the, I mean, the whole reason why Jeff and I started the Triple Point podcast, right? We talk about weather and climate, technology and society, um, because all of them work together to make a better society, right? Um, and safer society. And and so I, you know, Jeff really likes the, the tech, he'll, he'll, he'll balance, he'll balance the technology uh, and I'll balance on the, the side of like the social sciences. So I'm really fascinated to see where AI goes. I'm thinking about like, you know, the tediousness of the human and the, the activities that, that we have to do to produce a tap or, you know, there, there's a lot of mundane tasks that, a, you know, meteorologists, especially, um, you know, our, our early career meteorologists have to, you know, you learn, learn the career field and that sort of thing coming up. I'm thinking like, when we're doing like reinforcement learning or machine, you know, um, machine learning and those kind of things, it, it is some of this just actual just brute force where you're like identifying, you know, there, there's, there's plenty of, um, plenty of um, online media that talk about, you know, machine learning from the standpoint, like show you a picture. Is this a dog? Is this a cat, cat, dog, you know, 
assigning those images, um, you know, is is that some of the work that we have to do in in the weather field to identify things like this is a cloud, this is not a cloud, you know, to help train these machine learning models? Is that brute force method? Is that what we're doing um, along with the algorithms? Like, how how are we doing that? What what's the mechanics look like? Well, you're talking about the labels, really. Right. And so when John was talking earlier about supervised learning, I I didn't dive into those details of supervised versus unsupervised versus semi-supervised. But, you know, if we're doing supervised learning methods, which is what most of deep learning is, um, we need those labels. And so we do need those labels from the humans. Uh, We prefer not to have to go outsource it by convincing a bunch of humans to go out and label it. We prefer to be able to just find archives of labels. So it turns out for the fronts, for example, that NOAA has archived every front they've ever done. They've drawn them for many, many years. Turns out industry hasn't. IBM doesn't archive their fronts that they draw. They only keep them for 90 days because that's what the FAA requires. But you know, that data that you're talking about, the outlining the clouds, the, you know, saying what kind of storm it is, et cetera, that data is definitely what we need to be training on. You know, where was the tornado? How much hail was there? All of that data we need. Because you can't just if you just have the AI train without any of that, it's just gonna hallucinate. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to make the data up where it doesn't have it. Yeah. So I wonder if there's a connection here too, to sort of the idea of explainable AI or interpretable AI. I mean, when Mm -hmm. you talk about sort of brute force, um, one of the things that we're working to do is to make sure that we can sort of see within into the black box, the so-called black box and, and understand what the algorithm is doing. And I think that that can help inform then what the training data needs to, to be, maybe with the architecture. Maybe Amy, maybe you can say more about that. I think you're closer to that work. No, that, I think that's a, a good answer. I mean, the XAI is what the short name of the explainable AI is, right? The, the idea of the XAI is that we can not just develop an AI, but actually see what the AI is thinking and see what it's doing. It's I, I don't I use thinking in quotes. I mean, you can't see the quotes on the podcast, but that it's not thinking like it's alive, but like, what, what is it? What is the AI method thinking is most important to making this prediction? And that helps us make sure that it's physically realistic, which helps with trust and also helps to make sure that it's not hallucinating completely. Um, there's caveats that the XAI methods aren't perfect either. Knowing exactly what's going on inside the AI methods is, is a tricky unsolved problem and something we're working on. Something that keeps coming back to my mind or as we're talking through this, you know, we talk about labeling features and fronts and all of these things. And these are all very human centric things that we're using to describe what's happening in a very fluid, you know, environment. I mean, the atmosphere, you know, it's, it's air, right? Like, so there's, you know, what, if you were to explain a front, what is a front, right? You know, I mean, you have to go through all of the characteristics and those characteristics describe something about the state variables, the temperature, the humidity, all of these different things. And so, um, how much, uh, so I, I understand we're doing some things to label, you know, the fronts, label the features that are impactful to humans, but on a purely data driven level on the, I, I guess it's probably the unsupervised machine learning level. Like, what are we doing in, in that arena in the community? Um, more of the data-driven uh, techniques, I guess. So that'll that get us sense? to the generative AI, generative AI really, um, which may be where you're going, right? So there's been some articles recently in the news that you'll probably put into your references about data purely data-driven AI um, solutions to weather forecasting. So NVIDIA has one called ForecastNet. Um, Pangu Weather has one. Google has one. Um, they don't use numerical weather prediction models at all. They just take data and then try to move that data forward using AI methods. Um, Are they able to solve the same problems that the numerical weather prediction models solve right now? No. Are they probably going to be able to at some point? Maybe. I think that they are showing a lot of really interesting promise. Um, They're not quite there yet, but they're they're, you know, you mentioned earlier about the models that are faster. They can run a lot faster than the NWP models do. Downside, they take a lot of computational resources to train. I mean, I know uh, Google kind of casually threw out in their paper, oh, this took three months to train on this many TPUs, right? That, yes, yes, I saw that. They, the podcast users can't see that, but the, the, the symbol of resources and, and how much you have, right? I mean, it's it's not cheap to train at all, but it can be cheap to run forward, which can be really nice because you could do things like run a thousand ensembles 
um, and get an answer perhaps of the uncertainty in a much more cheap way than doing it with a numerical weather prediction model. But then you're doing it in a way that is really hallucinatory. It doesn't involve any laws of physics. It's it's really tricky. Yeah, the the that part kind of concerns me. And now I'm going to make an anecdote, so I can't say this because I haven't worked a lot with uh, weather and climate, um, AI, machine learning stuff. I mean, I had my time during the Air Force doing a few things from a high level. But um, what, you know, I've, I've used chat GPT probably like every, you know, nearly, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people in the audience and maybe including yourselves. And I've asked, so when I give chat, even the, the 4.0 version, a somewhat unconstrained problem, I'll say, okay, so for instance, I, I gave it a copy of all of the transcripts the that, that went live um, from some of our podcasts, and I tried to get it to write some constructive uh, narratives on some things. And it can do an okay job when it's very constrained. Write me a summary of this podcast. But if I said write a novel, <laughs> or not a novel, but a, write write a nonfiction book of all you know of all of this, it completely breaks down, and then it starts hallucinating. And it, it you know when I actually did this experiment, and it's like saying stuff that I said that other people said, and I'm like, none of this actually happened, <laughs> you know. So, <laughs> So, Correct. So, so I'm thinking from a weather perspective, now we're in the like the actual forecasting of, you know, the actual environment. Now my my turn for noise, my robot vacuum is starting up. Anyway, I'll turn that off. Um, so uh, anyway, so yeah, yeah, it's definitely. I think, that, I think that's apropos to, <laughs> I, yeah, know I know AI and robot. The robot just started. <laughs> it just has a mind of its own. All right. Yeah. Uh, I programmed it to do that, but um, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the chat GPT thing is interesting. I mean, even my, like I said earlier, even the Catholic priest is talking about chat GPT and, you know, the, the where, where, you know, where's, where's the world going when, it, when, or, but I mean, like there's the bottom line is there's, there's limitations. I think in one of Jeff's, um, one of the things that he shared, it was saying, you know, Dr. So-and-so um, w was a guest on our show and, you know, so and so wasn't actually a doctor or a PhD, but they they put that you know that that uh, that they bestowed that new title. Yeah, I, on that I think it was. And that's our, a minor. That's a minor example, yeah. right? I think it was our first episode. We had Matt Stratton, who he's a retired Air Force uh, weather officer as well, but he's now the emergency manager. Pretty important county from a hurricane perspective. But um, he, uh, we were talking wildfires and a wildfire they had real close to their town. Anyway, it turned him into like a wildfire uh, research scientist, <laughs> which is not what he was. I mean, he had some expertise on it, but it's just stuff like that, that if, uh, you know, a human wasn't over the loop, it sounded very convincing. You know, if somebody hadn't listened to that podcast like myself and. So what is, I mean, what does chat GPT mean for, for, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a version or not a version, but it's a use of AI, right? So what is, I mean, from the weather and climate perspective and the delivery of the, our information to society, what does chat GPT um, mean to the career, this career field? Yeah, Ron, I think, do you want to um, take a, yeah. Yeah, well, so I think that first of all, chat GPT is, is a little mind boggling and amazing in what it can do and, and how, you know, realistic its responses look. And I think it's taken some of us by surprise that uh, we've gotten sort of to this point this quickly. Uh, so yes. it, so <laughs> it, it is an amazing technology. Um, the hallucination problem is very real. And I think part of, the, you know, the promise um, for technologies like this is the ability to generalize really personalized, targeted, information to people about, you know, what the weather is going to be and what it means to them, how they might want to act. Uh, you know, do you take your umbrella today? You know, it should be able to advise you that. And the danger is hallucinations. You know, if, if you are an airline, are you going to be taking advice from chat GPT? I don't think so anytime soon. Um, so, you know, so there's promise there, but there, I think there's work to be done to make that a a trustworthy AI, especially when you get to some of the really critical decision makings, which tend to be the rare ones, right? It, 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 it tends to be the things that haven't 
happen may may not be well represented in the 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 corpus that the large language model learned from. So uh, that's where I think we need to pay special attention. And and I'll say too, some of the the use of of gener generative AI and and deep learning to do numerical weather prediction. That's that's also come faster, I think, in the last uh, year or so than many of us were anticipating. And I think people, longtime practitioners of numerical weather prediction are sort of sitting up and taking notice. It is pretty amazing that it, now a lot of these models are trained on reanalyses like the ECMWF's uh, reanalysis, ERA-5, and, and just sort of chaining forward. And so it, it it's... Uh, amazing that it's learning and it's being competitive with the era five there's still a lot that you would need to add to that to make it a self-contained forecast system um and um yeah and exactly the path to that and how quickly that'll happen isn't clear but it opens up this this fabulous world of being able to quickly run very large ensembles which can tell you perhaps about all the different ways that the weather could play out and that's critical for making optimal decisions is you know being able to really get a grasp on what what do we know what do we not know about how the weather is going to play out over at different time frames and i like i, I want to add one more thing to that we had a um, panel at ams this year uh and john's boss was actually on it um and one of the questions that came up was about chat gpt asking you know how we were going to use chat gpt we also uh we had multiple people on the panel and and uh the the social science view on this particular question is also very different than what necessarily like chat gpt i think is fascinating the public but i don't think the public necessarily understands how much it can hallucinate like you're talking about just make up extra degrees when you there's a lawyer out there who asks it to write some briefs and it makes up law cases you know it, it does a lot of things. And I think that from the social science perspective, there's a real concern about what, how this might get deployed too early, right? Because I think that the promise of doing some of that personalization that John was talking about is great. Think how many times somebody says, but when is the tornado coming down my street? But when is the hail going to come to my area? You know, when, when are we going to be safe? It'd be great if you could have something that could actually tell you precisely, you're, you know, given your phone and your location, this is exactly what's going to happen. But there's a peril there. Because if it starts hallucinating and people start to trust it too early, it could be doing some really serious harm, right? And and we might people might not evacuate. Yeah, it's sending yeah. them in the wrong direction potentially. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're we're at the the early stages. I <clears throat> there is a leading competitor who has a plug in on Chat GPT. I won't mention their name. Uh, <laughs> the, anyway, so I I I said, what's the forecast for my city today? You know, and and it gives me the forecast, and then it says. The temperature will reach a high of 84.64 Fahrenheit. I'm like, that's really <laughs> specific. <laughs> and the, uh, I'll experience wind speeds of 17.82 miles per hour. And the precipitation intensity will be 3.82 inches. I'm like, man, this is really... I think that you should do. Now. <laughs> I think you should do a. Uh, I think you should do an, a verification analysis on that, Jeff. You got your weather sensor there, so <laughs> yeah. Well. We're we're coming down. Uh, we got a we got a couple more questions as we kind of uh, wind down our time uh, on the podcast today. Um, Jeff, I know you, you want to dive into to technology probably, and then uh, we, we want to talk about. So I mean one one of the one of the questions that we often like to ask our guests is because we have a fair amount of young aspiring uh you know meteorologist leaders out there maybe college students um what do you what advice do you have for meteorologists when it comes to ai uh maybe what they should be studying beyond the dynamics and thermodynamics of their you know, meteorology degree i think they should try to take a class okay so just a couple of years ago meteorology was trying to get people to just learn how to program and now we're telling you to go take ai but on the other hand i'm going to say that I think that you sh if you're, you should look for a class in AI. A lot of universities are now offering sort of not a gen ed style, but a non-majors AI class so that you don't have to be a computer science major. And take that so you can learn just something about AI so that when you're in inevitably going to end up using it for some part of your job, it's not just a complete black box. Do you? you have some foundation that you can draw upon? I'm not saying that the meteorologists have to go become AI experts. 
fabulous when they do. I'm working on training some of those, right? But I don't think by any means that we need to have that for all meteorologists. But I think that given the amount of AI that's going to be used in the jobs over the next, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, they need to not just be, what is that? Or, oh, I, I learned about AI on the news, right? Because what you're learning about on the news isn't really AI. You're learning only the downsides. You need to go have some core foundation in it. And I think that they should try to find that non-majors course to take. What kind of jobs, and this is for either one of you, what kind of jobs are popping up that are new? So maybe they're in the weather and climate space, but like it's a new type of job just because of AI or machine learning. Well, there are lots of people who are hiring right now for people who understand AI and weather for a variety of applications, right? To develop new AI methods for new weather prediction, to use the AI in intelligent ways. Um, I some. They're, 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 these jobs didn't exist even five years ago. Like traditional companies like the weather company are trying to hire for this, right? NOAA is trying to hire people who have AI. And I just did a reference for a student who was looking for a forecaster position. So like entry level positions at NOAA for a, a, the National Weather Service. And they wanted to know if he knew about AI and they considered it a big bonus that he knew about AI, even though he was going to be doing traditional forecasts. So I think that the jobs aren't necessarily changing, although there are some new jobs out there like um, hedge funds. Are using AI to do, and they're doing, you know, short forecasts and long. I, I'm not into the stock market. We call it long and short, right? When you're trying to long understand what's going to happen yeah. at the subseasonal level, right? So they're looking for people who can do AI forecasting at the subseasonal level, so they can decide whether they should go long or short on the the market. And John probably yeah, I, has a, a better perspective on that. Than, I, those are my well, no, are my but, references. I'm just, I just say when when I look at some of the uh, people who have joined our team recently have been really successful uh, with us. They have an intersection of uh, meteorology, um, computer science or software engineering ability, and data science, at least awareness of data science and AI and, and machine learning. Uh, a, a little bit of knowledge of cloud computing certainly helps a lot these days. Um, some big data experience, maybe a geographical information system, GIS experience, um, and experience in sort of interpreting and manipulating and visualizing data, having curiosity about data, having skepticism about data, um, and, and then also an appreciation for human factors, because ultimately what we're building is meant to serve society, serve people and, and businesses. So having some understanding of what users want and and sort of the social science and, uh, and risk communication aspects that we were talking about um, earlier. So um, that, you know, we can be sure that we're solve, uh, you know, aware of the new problems that are coming along and the new opportunities, how technology can match up with, with needs and uh, solving problems that matter. Prediction time by 2030, where is the weather career field in terms of its use of, or AI uh, use and human capital? Uh, where will the human add value? So you want to go uh, first, this John? Is, <laughs> this is this is not an easy question. Prediction is hard. Obviously, you know, in the early days of the internet uh, or the iPhone, who would have guessed how those would have changed our lives? I think we're maybe at an inflection point like that right now with our artificial intelligence. I agree. Uh, large language models, uh, generative AI. Um, so really hard to, to look into the future. I do think our, our forecasts will be more personalized. Um, you will get a different uh, forecast if you're a mom uh, than you're, if you're a retired person or if you're uh, you know, a business person with a particular business. I, I think too, one of the things that we need, a, a nut that we really need to crack is um, we, we wanna help businesses make optimized decisions. And so far, a lot of the data that we would need to really understand how these businesses work uh, is not available. So that, that's, I guess, maybe one of my hopes is that over these next several years, as it's clear the power that AI has to help us make better decisions, to help us optimize processes, that we will have better, more ubiquitous data about those important processes. And that may be emergency management, uh, it may be how an airline operates. Uh, it may be about how people live their lives or, or their susceptibility to, um, you know, disease or, or different challenges from, from the weather and the climate. Our last guest, Ed Kearns from First Street Foundation, brought up a really interesting point when they were trying to do flood risks for now and into the future that they had to 
put feet on the ground and get all of the data or to go find the levies that weren't at the federal level. So like the state mm-hmm. and local levies and things like that, they needed that data to help with their risk you know, predictions. And so I wonder if that's kind of like the type of data you're talking about. Like we have a lot of the, you know, large sort of almost national data sets. There's a lot of disaggregated data out there for companies, for people, for states and counties and all of these different things. So maybe that's, you know, the, one of the next things, one of the things we try to do with this podcast too, is develop interesting business insights and things that people mm-hmm. could use to, to, to follow and stuff. So, um, I think anyway, what yeah, that's interesting. What this, that, yeah. this this whole topic is doing really is is I mean, I, and I look at like what the pandemic did um, in terms of like bringing data to the surface. Like, it made us understand and realize that we're not collecting data on a lot of things that we could make insightful predictions if we had data on different things, right? So, um, and, and so I think it's really opening up the aperture because. We can have all the weather data in the world we want, but if we don't have what the actual impact is on a business or an operation or you know a decision that's being made, then then it's just weather data uh, at the end of the day. Um, and so that's that's what's so fascinating to me about this whole uh, AI conversation. Amy, did you want to share any final thoughts? Like John said, prediction is really hard, but I'll give one that I'm relatively certain of, which is that it's going to transform what we're doing, right? The jobs that the students are getting right now and the jobs that people are doing right now are not going to be the jobs that they're doing in 2030. Is that terrifying? Maybe it is to some people, but it really shouldn't be. I think the AI, as we talked about, is coming to help, help automate some of these things and that our jobs are going to be just different. And along those lines, that that kind of gets us to that education question you asked a few minutes ago, right? we can't just be continuing to train sort of the traditional way because the world is adapting out from underneath us. The students need to be adaptable so that when they get these jobs, they understand how to, to use the new tools. And I think that, that, that my prediction is just that it's going to be, there's going to be a whole suite of new tools that are available that the students and, and people in the jobs can use that will change that personalized experience. I really like what John was talking about, that personalized experience that we'll be able to talk about, you know, the health effects of what's happening and the, the different forecasts for the different people. But that, that you know, it's just that the humans are still going to need, be needed. The humans are still going to be adding value, but they're going to be using AI as a tool. That's my, my thinking of the change is that AI is going to become something you can just push a button and you say, oh, this model did this thing. Okay, you know, it's just become yet another input. But you need to be yeah. savvy enough about it that you know what its limitations are. It seems to me that, I mean, like the, what you're getting at is, you know, the future generations are going to have to be more and more flexible, adaptable t- as, as, as technology yeah. accelerates. Um, and, and that's, there's a digital you know, natives th- too. Remember? Yeah. They, they digital, say, digital, so. na- d- digital, digital literacy is, is going to be critical. And it's not just for meteorologists out there. I think that society as a whole it needs to affect everything we're doing in education, by the way. So well, and it's going to, I mean, like you, you I, I can't imagine what you're facing as a professor, you know, um, with, with this technology that's out there and like, okay, well, how do you do exams? And I mean, like it's, 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 it's forcing world. us to have a very, uh, interesting conversations. And that's, it, that's when it comes down to the whole responsible AI kind of movement. This has been fascinating. I feel like we could have a whole nother hour, hour and a half conversation on this, um, but uh, this has been uh, this is great to talk with you today, Amy and John. It's time for the lightning round. What is the most memorable weather event in your life? Um, yeah, so for me, it was a, a hailstorm in, I, I believe, August 1978. I grew up in Colorado Springs, and I was an inter- enterprising boy. So I had planted a, a big garden on a, a empty lot near our house and planned to sell the vegetables and make money from them. And it had been a lot of work and it was, it was growing well. I had pumpkins and squash and tomatoes and, and we had a hailstorm that dropped several inches of hail, you know, just stripped all the trees, smashed the garden. So that was my uh, unfortunate introduction to uh, mm-hmm. agriculture um, and, and uh, definitely made a huge impression on me. How about you, Amy? I think it's going to be relatively similar. Um, my dad was in the Air Force, and while we were living in Ohio, 
Um, we were out doing some errands and the sky was green. And, you know, I was young. And this was uh, before I knew what green skies had any association with weather. We came back home and uh, five trees had fallen on our house. We had experienced a microburst and it had knocked a whole bunch of trees on our house. Now, I thought it was an adventure because I was young. So I wasn't disappointed like John. My parents didn't think about so much about the adventure, right? It knocked in one of our basement walls. It broke our roof ridge. But we had a 200-year-old tree that fell on top of our house. And it, I thought we were living in a tree house. It was kind of an adventure. Um, it just, But it was very memorable. The other thing that's related to that, while those years in Ohio, um, my dad was stationed overseas for a year of that. And this relates to John's and it just made me, it made me think of it while he was answering. Um, we saved a whole bunch of the hail that fell that year in a bag in the freezer for my dad so that when he got home, we could show him all the hail that had happened that year. Oh, no way. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's a, hey, that's a family connection thing right there. It's small. All right. All right. Uh, uh, Beecher Mountains. For me, it's mountains. I grew up in Colorado Springs with Pikes Peak, uh, perfectly framed in my bedroom window uh, and uh, clamoring around the foothills there. So yeah, mountains for me. I have a really hard time picking, so I like both because I've lived in lots of places. I really love the mountains. They're beautiful. They're wonderful. Um, but I also really like the beach because I have a lot of great childhood memories of being on the beach. So I'm going to say both. That's okay. You're not the first to say both. <laughs> yeah, some have said mountains on the beach, which there are there some places in the world like that. Um, yeah. So, uh, all right. What about, uh, what? Are, what is your superpower? Yeah, so for me, I think I can be pretty tenacious when I have a tough problem to solve and, and single focused and uh, have a hard time letting go of it even. Um, and uh, you know, so that can be a superpower, um, but that can also have a disadvantage. Sometimes it is good to know a lost cause when you see one and, and go on to something else. I thought about this in advance and I don't know because I feel like there are a lot of things I could answer. Um, I'm going to go with probably the amount of energy I have because I have a lot of energy and that helps me get a lot of things done. And it helps me yeah, get, we... it helps me lead AI to ES, for example. When you came on, so we haven't met, uh, I haven't met either one of you in person, but when you came on this morning uh, to the podcast, Amy, the energy that you brought is, is kind of what I thought I, I thought of in mind. So I think that's a great superpower. And thank you for powering AI2ES and uh, the, the technology that's going to uh, improve the way that we do you know, weather and climate prediction in the future. John, thanks for what you do there at the, the weather company. From the industry side of the house, there's just so much, um, so much going on in this space, and uh, Jeff and I are really looking forward to seeing um, what what comes of the technology coming forward. Really appreciate you being on the Triple Point Podcast today. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's Triple Point Podcast. If you liked it, give us a five star rating on your favorite podcast station. And make sure you tell your friends how to sign up for our newsletter. If you have questions, email us at triplepointpodcast at the number 81degrees.com. Until next time, have a great week.